Hi, everyone. Welcome to Co-Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Sarah Boston, and we have a great little chat today. We're popping across the pond and you get a chance to meet Dr. Rowan Francis, who is a human interventional cardiologist, meaning that he's human, but also treats humans. He's also a YouTuber and a comedian. He's in the edutainment science space. He writes jokes about mitochondria, you guys, and space. He loves space. He takes science topics, mostly medical, and he tries to break them down for people uh, to make them understandable for everybody. And then he crams as many jokes in as he can. He's here for all the science nerds. Uh, we're here for him. Uh, please enjoy this chat with Dr. Rowan Francis. Welcome, Dr. Rowan Francis. Uh, thank you so much for being on Co-Medicine. Nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I'm going to go over your bio, but you do a lot of different things. This podcast is really focused on comedy. I can't put you in a box even with your comedy. So uh, usually I start with the medical side. So let's start with that briefly. And then we'll. I'm so fascinated by everything that you're doing on the comedy side. So you are an interventional cardiologist. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Okay. And I know you love explaining medical terms and scientific terms to everybody so everyone can understand. But can you just briefly explain what an interventional cardiologist is? So I'm, you know, a general cardiologist as well. So I look after all things related to the heart and the cardiovascular system. But my interest is in the intervention side. And what that means is kind of stents. So, you know, angioplasty, people having heart attacks and things like that. So it's pretty varied. I work in two different hospitals. One is a more general, uh, smaller hospital. And then I work in a specialist cardiac center where I do the kind of complicated procedures and things. Is this correct? You're currently doing a PhD? I've come back into clinical practice and the less the less said about when I'm submitting my thesis, the better. So let's uh, <laughs> move swiftly on. <laughs> okay, we'll move on. <laughs> that is happening in the background. Well, I can't even imagine how you're doing that. So so kudos to you. Whenever, whenever it's done, it will be done. Tell me if this is correct. I was trying to do some research about you. You have studied space or you're interested in space. Yeah, I did a, a degree in space medicine and altitude medicine and things like that. And plan A was always to, to try and become an astronaut. It's very difficult from the UK. There's very few opportunities to get in. I was too young the first time it was, was open. And then it was open a couple of years ago. But by that stage, uh, I'd already kind of given up on the dream and gone down a more conventional path. So they said my CV wasn't really spacey enough. It just came at the wrong time. But having said all of that, there were 23,000 applicants for 12 spots in the European Space Agency. So there's absolutely no chance that I would have got it anyway, Had I, even if I'd been right at the, the right stage. Yeah, so that was plan A. And then I thought uh, I'll go for a more terrestrial kind of career. But you still seem to have a bit of a fascination with anti-gravity and how the body works. And we'll come on to this other side of my career, which is, is the whole YouTube side and, and having this interest, you know, doing it as a as a YouTuber means that I can still maintain that interest in a field, which I'm, I'm really not working in at all. I've done a few small collaborations with proper space doctors, but yeah, it allows me a chance to still feel like I'm involved, even though I'm not really contributing in any significant way. I just find it a fascinating field and it, it, it goes nicely with cardiology. There's a lot of physiology involved. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I can't wait. So let's just jump into the comedy side because I'm really fascinated with what you're doing. Again, I don't know how to put it in a box because you do, I would call it edutainment. Yeah. I think that's, that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> I like that term a lot, but you're a YouTuber. You have a YouTube channel called Medlife Crisis. And then I don't know if this is a big part of what you do. I just want to hear you talk about what, what you, how you see yourself, but you've done TED Talks and you've done a bit of stand-up or I don't know if you're doing a lot of stand-up comedy. I've done a, f a fair bit, yeah. That actually started before the YouTube channel, but then the pandemic happened and everything and I kind of concentrated more on the kind of online side of things for obvious reasons and, you know, I've really enjoyed that side. But I actually found recently from 2004 when I was at medical school, my first ever stand-up gig. So I've found a video and it's, uh, it's horrendous. <laughs> it is documented somewhere. So, so I, that was my first foray into kind of trying to tell jokes on stage. And then it kind of went dormant for quite a few years, just while I was a junior doctor and kind of concentrating on work. And then around the time I started the, the PhD and had a little bit more free time, then I sort of have always 
told jokes as part of my presentations at work. So people kind of said, you know, why don't you just, just do this as a thing in itself and started doing very safe, friendly kind of comedy nights with very geeky, nerdy audiences. And I think that's probably my niche. I do medical comedy, but I think probably a bit different to a lot of doctors who do comedy where it's a bit more about the clinical side of the job, whereas mine's a kind of a bit more science focused. So I've got stand up sets about mitochondria or, or stuff like that. It's kind of a bit esoteric and, and odd. The, the YouTube side was a kind of logical extension of that, that I just kind of put some of those into, into video form. It's been really surprising how it's kind of taken off and it's like a whole second career now. Your audience on YouTube sounds like it's a bit different from your stand-up audience. Is that right? Because you're, it feels like you're trying to reach people and educate people with your, with your videos. Probably the only reason people have come to see me specifically doing comedy was because of YouTube. So last year, I, it was my first solo gig in Northern Ireland, so in another country. And, and I don't imagine anybody would have paid to come to see just me unless I already had that kind of YouTube audience. So it's certainly, you know, one complements the other. But I think they're probably quite similar audiences. But yes, I, YouTube, I, I am definitely trying to educate some videos more than others. I, I describe my videos as clinically useless because I don't think they have any <laughs> actionable medical information, but they're kind of interesting things, etymology of medical terms or sort of some medical history or ethical kind of philosophical topics. Actually, the next video I'm going to put out is much more serious. It's, it's all about like end of life stuff. So I think that's another great thing about YouTube is you can just do whatever you want. I'll make a completely silly video. I think probably the, the one that is most popular is where I rank organs, deciding which are the best organ and the worst and everything. And, and that's just completely silly. But that really seemed to go down well. It's great to have that variety. And what's your favorite organ? Is it the heart? I mean, well, that's such a basic answer for me, isn't it? <laughs> My joint top organ was the liver. Oh, I am absolutely in awe of the liver. But yes, of course, I'm going to put the heart top as well. Right. Yeah, the liver deserves respect, though. Yeah, I, I think it flies under the radar. I think the, the <laughs> average person doesn't appreciate how much the liver does. <laughs> it's underrated yeah. as organs go. And people abuse their livers. There you go. We should, we should respect our livers. I saw a TED Talk that you did online. You were talking about exercise. It was really cool because you brought out a trainer, I think, yeah. and then someone who was doing a, I don't know if they were a cardiology technician or ultrasonographer, but they were ultrasounding that person's heart. At the same time, the person was exercising. And so you were explaining. I think that was a lay audience, not a yeah, scientific that was, that audience. Was... Yeah. So you were trying to explain. But I mean, what an amazing way to use technology as well to help people understand their heart and what's happening. But when you started that TED Talk, you were talking about a magic bullet and a treatment that's underrated and something that can help with heart disease and stress and all these things that I thought you were going to say comedy. Oh, yeah, true. Yeah. I was like, oh, he's going to say comedy, but it was exercise, which is also a magic bullet, I think, for health. I was wondering, what are your thoughts on comedy and medicine and how they, you obviously have those two sides of you, but like, how do you think comedy can help healthcare professionals? Yeah, in different ways. I guess a lot has already been said about, you've discussed these things with previous guests as well, about the role comedy has always played for healthcare professionals as a coping strategy, you know, so amongst ourselves, sort of using comedy to, to kind of put things into context and not get completely overwhelmed. But in my day-to-day -day practice, I think I use it a lot, probably maybe a bit too much, I think sometimes. It, you don't always quite read the patient entirely correctly. And sometimes I'll crack a joke and it just goes down like a, a lead balloon. But I find generally patients respond really well. And, you know, I think we all bring different things to the table. I'm not the most knowledgeable cardiologist in the world. I'm not the most accomplished academic or anything. But I feel like that's something that I can offer in my sort of interactions. And I think patients appreciate it that you can just, you know, have a bit of a laugh and put a bit of humor into often quite serious situations. So I wouldn't go as far as I've heard people be quite prescriptive that, you know, every medic should do some kind of comedy training or something like that. I don't know about that. It certainly is a neglected aspect of the patient interaction that I think people can use. It'll come more naturally to some than, than others. So I'm probably not the best at the kind of very hand-holding, 
comforting bedside manner. I think I'll hold my hands up and say that other people break bad news better than than I do. But then, for, you know, for some patients, I think I probably connect with them well as as well by using uh, some lighthearted humor. Yeah, I think it's really needed. Do you think it can help us? you know, as healthcare professionals as well, like, do you use it with your colleagues? Or is it kind of more something about how you interact with, like, it's more public facing? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no aspects of my life where I don't try and force feed comedy to the recipients, (laughs) whatever they're doing. It's not always welcomed. Uh, Teaching, I think, is, you know, a great example. It's kind of the norm, particularly if you're working in in a teaching hospital, of course, a lot of your role is teaching medical students and junior doctors. And perhaps because I was, you know, quite recently a, a junior doctor that I, I still I'm, I'm very passionate about training the next generation. So I really take an interest in that and I enjoy giving lectures and, and sort of small group teaching and stuff like that. And that's definitely where I find it really useful, because I think especially these days, there's so much to take in when you're a when you're a young doctor, loads of information. It can feel a bit overwhelming. And I don't know how. UK medicine problems are, are covered or if, if they're sort of well known outside of the UK, but we've had all kinds of chaos going on recently. In fact, this week, there are the latest set of junior doctor strikes happening, which I think is going to be the sixth set or something like that. It's kind of carnage now. And I really feel for some of these doctors up and coming because they're entering a profession which is very different to when I graduated just you know over 15 years ago now I had an amazing time you know when I was training my residency I was so much fun it was hard work but it was it was really fun and I, I don't know if that's the case these days I really don't know if they're enjoying things as much as we did so I try and introduce that if I can I, I really try and make it a fun experience for them if I can I think it's really important for lecturing conferences just thinking about people going to a conference and sitting through hours and hours of lecture. And if it's all the same PowerPoints and there's no humor or stories injected, I think it's very hard to even get something out of that lecture. Or maybe it's just me, but I I find for me, it can be a really good scientific lecture. But if there's not something to hook me in, it's hard for me to focus and and get something out of it. Totally. Yeah. I don't know if you can say this, but like you just said, you did jokes about mitochondria or can you talk about your joke writing process or just about like some of the things you like to joke about, whether that's mitochondria or other things, but the sciencey things that you like to write jokes about? I'm not sure I've got a joke writing process, really. I think I consume knowledge as, as much as I can. And I'm, I'm always reading random kind of science books and things. You know, when you are in that kind of world with a lot of other kind of geeky people, there are some things which are sort of inherently funny. And then you just kind of make notes of them or something like that. One of the first stand-up gigs I did was about, I was doing a heart transplant job at the time. And so then I was very fascinated by this kind of science fiction world where people have artificial hearts or some people have heterotopic heart transplants or they have two hearts. So I was like, well, you know, Doctor Who has two hearts and Klingons have like eight chambers to their hearts. And I thought, I can maybe make a kind of science fiction medicine kind of little type five that you know just grows out of that or or another one i did was about starting with a quite simple sounding question which is you know why is the heart on the left side of the body and then just the more i looked into it the more i kind of just found this rabbit hole of unproven unknown sort of scientific questions i guess to answer your question maybe i try and make a story out of, say, a a 10 minute set, I'll try and go on some kind of journey and take the audience along. So maybe that's the kind of main underlying joke writing thing. And then when I'm writing a video, for example, I will do a first pass, I'll write the video with the facts and the kind of the outline I want. And then I'll go back to the beginning and say, right, now, where can I introduce some, some jokes? And then, you know, maybe go on little random tangents and things. I think if you ask me right now to sit down and like write uh, which is something I have to do because I've I've been asked to to do a kind of more professional stand up gig to a medical audience. No one there is going to know who I am. I don't think. Now I'm really nervous. I've got to just come up with a, something from scratch. So I think that's going to test me. That's probably the first time because normally I just kind of formulate ideas over months or whatever, and they they kind of just sit in my head. And when they come to the boil, then I think right, I've got a thing I can put together now, and then I will go and book myself onto a 
comedy night or something rather than the other way around. So this will be a new experience for me. And when you're doing these jokes that are, I don't know what you said, geeky or sciencey and this podcast, we're all nerds here. So we celebrate nerds. Yeah. <laughs> <Uncle They're my laughs> people. They, are, they are my people too. I am one of the people. I think I see you as a YouTuber and I, it's just because I'm not in the UK. I, I think maybe I would know you more as a stand-up comedian, but where are you performing? Is it clubs? Is it, like you said, conferences? Or maybe you do a lot of different things, but where are you finding yourself performing stand-up comedy? The last 12, 18 months, I thought I'd try and do a few more live shows because I kind of got out of the habit of it. And YouTube is, you're your own boss. You can kind of just work to your own deadline. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll try. So I, I did a few festivals. So I don't know if you have the same kind of scene, but like literary festivals and, and arts festivals, music festivals, like Coachella kind of style music festival. We have nothing that big that I've done, but we've got sort of smaller ones here and they'll have a comedy tent. There'll be music going on, but there'll be a, a comedy tent or one of the ones was mostly kind of spoken word stuff. So I did a few of those. And then sometimes there'll be month-long science festivals where they'll have different events happening during the month of like you know comedy nights a few of my friends organize a regular kind of science comedy event so i've done a few of those they're great actually that's true like peak geekdom where you can have the most niche routine and, and you'll find an audience there and then i've done yeah more regular kind of comedy nights but again i've probably done a straight open kind of comedy night maybe only two or three times and because it's not something I'm pursuing in a in a big way I haven't tried to kind of push myself too much there and I've just kind of gone for the safer safer options to be honest you're well you're staying in your lane though which I think is is important I think it's hard sometimes to switch gears from like you know medical professional comedy to a club which is <laughs> it's very different <laughs> It's received differently. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. One year I'll, I'd love to maybe try the Edinburgh Fringe, which is, you know, one of the big events in, in Europe for, for comedy. Funnily enough, there were quite a few doctors performing at this year's Fringe. It's becoming, I think, more common for, for medics to try different things. And I think part of that perhaps is that medicine itself is becoming less, less attractive. So people are looking for other things to do. Yeah, I'm far from alone, I think. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about the pandemic as much as I don't want to drag us back there. But I, I noticed you did have some of your YouTube videos are kind of you're trying to help is a good word with the misinformation that was out there, I think, in general, but all, specifically about COVID and vaccination which isn't your exact field. I know you have a broad science background and you're your physician, but like, I just wonder if you can talk a little bit about, I mean, maybe it's obvious, but like why you were drawn to that and trying to help people be educated about uh, the vaccine, which became somehow very contentious. You've kind of mentioned two different points that where my thought process changed because prior to the pandemic, I was making videos about, you know, Leonardo da Vinci and, and stuff. And then when it all started kicking off. I thought exactly that. I thought, look, I'm a cardiologist. Like, I'm, I'm. This is not my area. But then it, you know, within a few weeks, we realized this is this is going to be a global thing, and and we're all going to be affected. So, I kind of realized, well, I've got this this platform. Maybe I actually should try and do something useful for a change, and make some videos relating to this. And I think we were all kind of forced into learning about COVID, weren't we? So. I still tried to make it a little lighthearted. So, so one of the early videos I made was good news that was happening and, and reasons to be positive early in the pandemic, different developments and, and scientific developments that are happening, which had me pretending I was Elizabeth Holmes from Theranos and doing a little dance and all kinds of nonsense. And that ended up winning a, like a science journalism award. I was like, whoa, okay, so this is like actually having some kind of impact here. But then, as you said, it, you know, it, it all quickly became, maybe not quickly, but soon became quite unpleasant and toxic. And, and that's the point when I, I checked out again. I just thought, I'm really not enjoying this. This is, a, this is a hobby for me. This is something I do for fun. And I'm now being attacked by everyone. Like I was trying to have a bit of nuance into the uh, vaccine conversation. This is by sort of 2021. And I was being called 
you know, opposite things. I was being called like some sort of pro-vax shill and I was being called an anti-vaxxer. And I was like, well, you know, what am I, what's going on here? Like, how, how is this? And I just thought, right, this is, this is not good for my mental health. I think I'd, I'd be, you know, disingenuous if I, if I didn't acknowledge that the pandemic really brought a lot more attention to the channel than I would have got otherwise. So I did start feeling a little bit of responsibility that I, I thought, okay, I, I need to try and help a bit if I can. So I hope that I did, but I'm equally glad that it's kind of not something that I have to do. And I don't feel that kind of, I, I can just get back to subjects that just interest me now. Right. Was there anything else you have brought up that was contentious? Like, I'm I'm, I, maybe I shouldn't be surprised because the anti-vaxxer movement was vocal. I guess I'll just say mm. that's, that's my nice way of saying that. But is, has there been other subjects that you've delved into that you've had negative reactions that you weren't anticipating? Yeah, I mean, there was one sort of diet stuff. And, and again, you know, I, I am always very conscious of my limits of my expertise. So I, I do try not to delve into fields like diet too much because my understanding of diet is fine for a cardiologist, but I'm not a dietitian. I'm, I'm not a nutritionist or anything, but, you know, I'm, I'm good at scientific analysis. So I kind of talk about trials and I've talked about keto and carnivore diets and, and vegan diets and things like that. And, and there is literally nothing you can say that will not result in some kind of hate mail. Uh, particularly if you talk about the carnivore diet and a lot of these very cultish beliefs, you just get inundated with people claiming that you don't know anything. Diet, vaccines, I think they're very contentious fields for, for whatever reasons, which doesn't put me off. But I think it would be fair to say that I have self-censored, like I have avoided topics that maybe I would have liked to have talked about because I just I just don't want that hassle. And certainly on like Twitter, which I've now kind of pretty much left entirely. On Twitter, I found that I was, I was not engaging in certain debates or topics because I just didn't want the hassle. So it's, it's sad, really, because... And I, I'm not leveling all of that at the anti-vaxxer contingent. I think that there are fringes on, on all different sides of every debate, which yeah. are very keen to shut down any discussion. And it's just, it's just exhausting. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, we're definitely in that world now where the opinions are so strong that it's hard for people to listen, just listen to the other side or recognize that there could be other points of view. Yeah, about vaccines. And in our world in veterinary medicine, it's raw food diets. That's a bit... Oh, really? Yeah. I saw there was a big controversy, um, somebody tweeting about their, their vegan cat. Oh, that's very controversial now. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And that kind of uh, went, went viral. But yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, that is another one. But they are carnivores. And but yeah, <laughs> some people, some people don't want them to be they want them to be I don't know, they want them to be vegetarian or vegan, but they can't. So yeah, and, and there was a recent article that came out that people interpreted in their own way, I will just say, yeah, they just decided to interpret it in their own way. So I mean, medlife crisis, it's a great name. Is it this the name? Or do you think like, because I joke about comedy being a midlife crisis for me? Or was it just is it just the name? Or is there more to it than that? Oh, I mean, it's kind of embarrassing now because of the space that I thought I was going to be in. I initially thought I would do like fitness tips. I was in my 30s. I'd gone into my 30s then. Like I could do fitness for guys over 30 and coming from a, from a doctor or something. And I kind of cringe now because that bro science kind of fitness space online is just all the ice baths and infrared testicular <laughs> saunas and perineal sunning and all this kind of nonsense that they talk about. But that's what I thought I'd do. I thought I'd talk about sort of fitness, slight, not, not really that 30s is, is midlife, but that was the origin of the name. And then I just thought, I don't want to do that. That's, that's ridiculous. So <laughs> I just went into more conventional topics. Oh, okay. Well, although it seems like you take on some topics that we just need a sensible voice or a you know, because otherwise people are going to find other things that are not, they're going to be finding the ivermectin for oh, yeah. COVID or those things because it's pseudoscience. And so I think your voice is important. Whatever you decide you want to talk about, I think it's important. <laughs> but maybe the bro, bro science is not where you want to be. They're a rich source of stuff to debunk, for sure. Oh, I mean, oh, there's that oh, too, yeah. right? I mean, you know, every other Joe Rogan episode, there's something that I, I just kind of hold my head in my hand and go, oh, no. And you know, if I was just going to do that the whole time, I'd go crazy. You debunk one thing, they've come up with some new thing tomorrow. 
it's funny because I've got a lot of creative friends who it kind of splits down gender lines. So there's the kind of goop crowd. So a lot of my female creative friends deal with all the pseudoscience there. And then the guys have to deal with the the Joe Rogan. And just they're two sides of the same coin. They're, they're literally yeah. wellness, but just with a male or female flavor. That stuff is really important, but I don't want it to be my main thing because you just go crazy. Yeah, you'd be exhausted. I totally understand that. It would be exhausting. Can you talk a little bit just for people who are interested in getting into the space of creating online or creating videos? Is that something you just figured out on your own or how did you learn to do that? It sounds cliched, but to learn YouTube, just go to YouTube. There's so many tutorials of, of things to do. It's it's really easy to pick up. And the first thing I, I tell everyone is, number one, I'd still rec- I hear a lot of people say, oh, it's too late. I've missed the boat. I don't think so at all. I think there's never been a better time to to start creating videos than than now. And you don't need much. You've got your phone already. Everybody's got a smartphone these days. The camera is more than sufficient. What I would say is get a microphone. That's the number one thing I would recommend investing in to begin with, but it doesn't have to be more than you know, 50 bucks or something. And that's really all you need to start with. And then just cut your teeth by giving it a try. So there are so many, the bar to get in, you know, especially with TikTok and stuff where the very amateur aesthetic is, is almost expected. If you have a really polished, well, three-point lighting, professional sounding TikTok, people will be like, hang on, this is, there's something dodgy going on here. This, this must have some corporate funding. You can just, you know, just dive in. But yeah, I, I, I just kind of figured it out myself and it's not, not hard at all. But I think the number one thing is you've got to decide what you're trying to say. I felt like my kind of angle of trying to blend medicine and, and comedy and, and kind of going for that slightly sciencey vibe hadn't been done all that much. So I was trying to bring something new. But now I find with, you know, medical students and junior doctors, it's almost ubiquitous. I, I joke with them now that it's become like a mandatory requirement to finish medical school to have a YouTube channel because so many of them, you know, and, and it's, it's funny that they'll come to that and be like, hey, midlife crisis. And, <laughs> you know, not, like they're the only people that recognize me, but I'm like the granddads, you know, they're like, they're not so into my stuff. They're more into the kind of the influencer medics who are in their designer scrubs and uh, doing a day in the life vlog and all this kind of stuff. And I've got nothing against that, but there's only so much you can say about a day in the life of a fifth year medical student. You know, everyone's going to say the same stuff. So what are you bringing yeah. to the table that's a bit different? I've actually got a, a good friend who's an interventional cardiologist vet. So I went to a veterinary conference. Uh, he invited me along to, to talk there. And then, you know, that was my first introduction to the humor that's in the, the veterinary circle, which obviously you're going to be much more familiar with. And then, you know, it made me realize that there are just loads of little niches out there. And that's what a lot of people say these days with YouTube is uh, I'm going to have to pronounce the word wrong for this to rhyme. It was an American who said this to me. And as a Canadian uh, who I'm sure has knowledge of French, you'll also be pained to to hear this. But they (laughs) said there's riches in the niches. Ah. But that's, I think, a saying that we hear on YouTube these days that... uh, you know, you could be as specific as you like. You know, you could you could set up a, a veterinary comedy kind of angle and you'll find an audience. I'm a, still a big proponent of, of YouTube. I, I do think it's the best social media platform, which is not saying a lot. That's a low bar. But uh, <laughs> I really do appreciate what, what it's allowed me to do. Yeah, the riches and the niches. I like that. I, it's interesting because it's kind of a tenant of comedy in general is that specificity. Totally, yeah. To make a, something funny, you have to be very specific, which feels counterintuitive because you think, well, I'm not going to appeal to everyone. And not everyone's going to find it funny. But yeah, that's what co-medicine is all about. We're yeah. pretty niche. <laughs> or we're niche, as they niche. say in America. Yeah. They're pretty niche. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great that you got to experience a veterinary conference. I'm curious about how you found I, we're dark as a group. I don't know if we're darker than physicians or not, but pretty neck and neck, I think. But I was I was amazed how similar a lot of the concerns are from the outside we might think because here in the uk you know we've got the national health service so so doctors in training are all government employees essentially whereas veterinarians it's all private so we kind of look at the outside think oh i bet they're all really well paid and stuff 
and meeting all the, the young vets at all different levels, but some of the younger ones I was chatting to, it's exactly the same career stress and, and money stress and lack of security with, with different things. So yeah, it was really fascinating actually how similar everything is with the one exception that when we were telling stories clinically, there's, there's this option of euthanizing the patient, yeah, which it's frowned upon if I decide to uh, to put a patient down. <laughs> Do they have? I'm sorry, I don't know this. Do they have? We call it made in Canada. No, we don't. But okay, I've been reading all about the Canadian made laws recently. Actually, that's the video that that, that I'm going to bring out next. Oh, okay. Yeah, you said that you're going to do some end of life stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is this is something I am a supporter of, but it's it's not legal in the UK. Uh, but Canada, you know, has has been slightly controversial because they've expanded it, haven't they? So yeah. No, it's a fascinating area. Yeah. No, we we don't we don't have that here. Okay, so definitely frowned upon. In <laughs> yes, the UK. exactly. Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> I I always think that there's a lot of conversations that happen before made was legal in Canada. And for anyone in in the states or UK who doesn't know what that is, it's medical assistance in dying. So it's essentially people consenting to have a their end of life controlled. I guess I would say with with a doctor. It's very controlled. I, I have a friend of the family who who chose that path. It's not just like calling and making an appointment for your dog. I guess I'll just say it's it's very regulated and and uh, multiple people have to sign off on it to the point that sometimes people, if they get to a certain point where they don't think that those people can make judgments for themselves, they lose the ability to have made, uh, which is a, another big challenge of it. But no one ever asks veterinarians what we think. Like they'll they'll talk to every other healthcare professional and we're the ones who we do that with mm -hmm. our patients a lot. So we have a lot of experience, but yeah, no one. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever it's in the media, I'm like, Oh, you could talk to us. We live this and we have a very different view than a lot of my medical colleagues who maybe don't agree with it or mm. just it's just not in your consciousness, right? It's not how you're trained. It's really interesting you say that because you're right that I don't think I've heard any kind of human medical professionals looking or soliciting any opinions from from vets, but patients and families often give the analogy and one of the people I quote in, in the video is, who actually was convicted for taking his wife's life, who was oh wow terminally ill, he was like saying that, you know, you, you wouldn't leave a pet in this kind of state of suffering. So, you know, why do we have a double standard for, for people? And so I often hear, hear people make that comparison. So that's really interesting, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, there's been a couple in Canada, just a few high profile cases like that, that Family members took things into their own hands, I guess I would say, but for a compassionate reason, but went to jail, yeah. went to jail for it. How are you going to approach that topic with humor or are you? It's not as funny a, a video. I'm not, I'm not trying. To, <laughs> okay. It's, but, okay. But I have, I have tried to crowbar some, some jokes in there. Yeah. And some were just kind of accidental. So let's see. Let's see. It's going to be a pretty different, okay. it's going to be a pretty different video for me, to, to be honest. It is more of a serious one. Well, people can look out for it because it'll probably come out at the same time as this podcast. So I'm excited to see what you do with it. I mean, there is that darkness of the sense of humor of medical people, which maybe it's just coping, and may but maybe we all need it, you know, to cope with difficult end of life issues or, you know, when people are sick. I know you deal with people who are, I'm assuming, a lot of emergency mm. work yeah. that you do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is very high tension, very high stakes. Yeah. Actually, I want to ask you a question. This is like a bit unrelated, but had a family member who had a heart attack. And the cardiologist talking about it, like he's okay now, but they called it, they called it the widow maker. Mm. Have you heard that term? I have. Yeah. I was like, maybe keep that in the back room. Yeah, I, exactly. <laughs> I don't, I don't say that to patients. No, He said it to the wife of the person going through it. And I was like, did that just, did that just fall out of your mouth? No, or did no, you, you yeah. shouldn't, shouldn't say that. Uh, it's got an interesting history that because in itself, it's kind of a misogynistic term, right? It's, it's assuming that only men get. LED occlusions, whereas, you know, we know that women get coronary artery disease equally to men. They may get it slightly later in life. So I think it's still fair to say that men may lose more years. But typically, you know, a lot of people still think of coronary disease as a, as a male thing. That's wrong. And that's based on a lot of research not involving women. It's based on, you know, a lot of historical imbalance of gender research. So the very fact that an artery in the body is called a widow maker when, you know, 50% of people who own that artery are women. It, it doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense. So it's definitely something that should be consigned to the history books, but then an inflammatory 
documentary came out a few years ago called The Widowmaker, which was basically funded by, it was encouraging people to get coronary CT scans. And there's oh, okay. th this kind of loops back to the, to the bro science uh, stuff we were saying earlier, this obsession with scanning and, and like testing and, you know, all these kind of bro science podcasts. And now they, they advise everyone get full body scans and CT scans and ultrasound scans and blood test panels, which is all non-evidence based and, and just anxiety generating. But uh, this documentary was concentrating on trying to tell everyone to get screening CT scans of their of their hearts, which I will, you know, go on record as saying I don't advise people to do, but it was called The Widowmaker. So that brought it kind of back into the, the consciousness, I think. Okay. You don't advise it because of the radiation risk or because of, or just it's not useful or everything about all about that? If someone is asymptomatic, then we don't have any evidence that doing scans is beneficial and it's likely to, to be harmful, not just because of the radiation, but you, you pick up incidental omas, which then, you know, you get stuck in the, the medical system and, and may end up with, with further tests or, or potential complications. If you have symptoms, of course, get checked out. But if you feel well, just steer clear of doctors. Don't trust them. <laughs> Stay away. There you go. Yeah, they're just trouble. Veterinarians, too, are just trouble. I'm kind of fascinated. You, you just do so many things. And I really appreciate your time coming and talk to us on co-medicine. How are you balancing your, uh, you're a father, uh, you have young children, you, you're doing a PhD, you're a clinician, you're teaching, and then you're making videos and you're performing. How are you balancing your time or your week or your months? Or how, how is that? How's that going? Because <laughs> I think there's lots of people who I mean, I admire everything you're doing, but how 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 are you finding that? Um, I don't know if I'm balancing it particularly well <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> I'm also clinical director in, in of my department as well now, which is kind of some somewhat against my wishes. I am feeling it. I'll I'll be totally honest. I, I I'm I'm really starting to, which is fine because I've got things in there that I can adjust. There are non-negotiables. Obviously, my family time comes first, and I'm 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 happy with that. But the YouTube side of things has had to take a bit of a backseat recently, which which is okay. You know, that that's all right. There is this fear that I think a lot of content creators or, or comedians or anyone who their notoriety is important. There's this fear that if you don't do anything for a, a little while, people forget about you. And, and there's probably some truth to that, but I think it's probably less of an issue than people imagine. So I've been three months between video uploads. It's okay. The growth of the channel is has slowed down a lot, but I've always said to myself that if I'm getting stressed by the YouTube side of things, then I've just given myself a second job. So what's right. the point of doing that? So I've, I've always just felt there is a lot of burnout in obviously medical professionals, but there's a lot of burnout in content creators. You know, one of the yeah. stuff that, that we talk about a lot, most of my friends in the field are full time on YouTube or other platforms, and they talk about burnout about as much as healthcare professionals do it, to be honest. And I think a lot of that is self-imposed. You know, they'll have weekly upload schedules or things like that. So I don't have to stick to those kind of rigid schedules or anything. But um, yeah, it's taken a bit of a backseat. And I think the solution to, to how I've done different things, I just don't sleep very much. I think that's one of the, oh, okay. uh, <laughs> the, the main tips uh, that I can give. But I, I don't think it's a very good tip to give. And I, I would not advise people to do it. Okay. You're just busy. <laughs> no, but it's fine. I get that question a lot and I've never really got a good answer because I just do things that I enjoy. So, you know, if I like it, I do it and yeah, things seem to fall into place. So it probably sounds more impressive than it is. Well, I'm impressed. Do you see the, the YouTube side? It is a job. Like some people, it's their oh, full time totally, job. Yeah. Do you like that you do both? Like I always ask on this, there's questions I ask everyone on this podcast. If you could be a full time, I don't know what you call your niche science or medical YouTuber. And that was like, you made the same amount of money. So it didn't affect your family at all. Would you want to do that full time? Or do you love being a physician and a cardiologist? <sighs> yeah. You know, to stay with it. You'd put that um, question in, in an email and I've been thinking about it today and I don't really know the answer. If you'd asked me last year, I would have said, oh, yeah, I love being a physician. That's what I feel I'm, I'm best at. But I don't know. It, it's really this, this last 12 months in, in the NHS, the National Health Service here, it's becoming so tough. You know, we've had a huge efflux of professionals to predominantly Australia, but many have gone to Canada as well. And several of my friends have, have gone to Vancouver, Toronto, and 
they don't want to work in the UK anymore. You know, we, we are hemorrhaging medical professionals and it's just becoming a, a grim time to work. And this is because of 13 years of, of underfunding under the, the current government. And it's just completely transformed from what it used to be. We used to be pretty well paid and had good morale, you know, and I think that, you know, nobody goes into to medicine in this country for money, but it was fine. It was fair and you enjoyed your job. So that's the main reason, you know, you, you do something. You, but now I think that like I was kind of alluding to earlier with, with the junior doctors going on strike, uh, which is predominantly about their pay not having increased for 15 years. But it's also all these other factors, you know, just morale is so poor. So I think that has really affected my answer. And if I could reduce my hours to, you know, you were chatting to Dr. Glaucon Flecken the other day, Will, and I've, I've spoken to him about this a few times, who works, I think, four days. I think that would be great if I could do something like that, just reduce my hours a bit and have a bit more time for, for other things. But at the moment, it's, it's not really on the cards. Then I'd feel like I'd happily just carry on being a physician and, and have a bit of a hobby. Probably the thing that's stopping me just jumping ship and becoming a, a full-time YouTuber is just the lack of job security. You know, tomorrow, yeah. if you're so dependent on a social media platform, they could change their algorithm. Suddenly, you know, you could see your income just plummet. And, and this has happened to friends of mine. At the end of the day, medicine is still a very secure job. For all the other problems I've, I've talked about, it's, it's one that I'm pretty sure I'll, I'll remain employed. And, and that's, that's a big thing, you know, particularly in this day and age, a lot of people don't have that kind of job security. So I'm very grateful for that. And I think I'll stick to, to being a doctor. But if you ask me which I enjoy more at the moment, I, I really do enjoy the, I, I like the whole process of making a video. I really enjoy the research, just reading about something new. I think it appeals to the kind of ADHD mind of like, uh, you know, just looking for new topics to be interested in every month. So I really enjoy that aspect of it and kind of being creative. I think that's probably the thing that motivates you as well is, is it's just have, nice to have a creative outlet. Yeah, absolutely. So Brexit didn't fix the NHS, apparently. Let, <laughs> Turns uh, out. That's a trigger word. You, you, should, you, <laughs> should, you should have given me a trigger warning before. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, we, do, we don't. I remember we don't, them uh, saying, oh, it's going to fix everything. What a nightmare. Did not fix it. Yeah. I thought that's what you were going to say when you said you're hemorrhaging talent because I oh, thought it's been a, a huge, lot of yeah, absolutely. Your foreign talent, that, right? We, we used to have yeah. a lot of professionals coming from the European Union and then they would, you know, particularly in, in my field, I don't know why historically, but we had a lot of Portuguese cardiac physiologists. So cardiology wouldn't work with the, the physiologists in, in all our departments. And they just kind of said, well, I'm, I'm out of here. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to stick yeah. around. And so now we can't, we can't appoint physiologists. We just can't find them. So it, it's, it's chaos. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've heard some of it, but not, I don't think I was as aware, but I knew that there was definitely problems there. I know you're super busy. No, so no, we're getting, don't worry. Uh, to the last question that I, we ask of every guest on co-medicine, I'm assuming you know who Ken Jeong is. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so now it's not to take away from how grateful I am that you are here, but he's like our He's our unicorn guest. If you could just invite, you're just speaking to not me and not people listening, or well, they can listen, but you're speaking <laughs> directly to Dr. Ken Jung. Could you just please talk to him and invite him to come on to Code Medicine? Ken, long, long time fan, uh, first time caller here. You really owe it to yourself to come on to a podcast where you can talk about your two loves, medicine and comedy. And I know that uh, Ken stays in touch with medicine. Because I've seen a few little videos he's done online where he's, you know, answering medical questions in a funny way. But actually, he answered with a lot of legit medicine. I'm like, oh, this, this guy still knows his stuff. I have really enjoyed talking about the overlap between the two fields uh, just now. And it's not something I get to do very often. And it's probably not something that Ken does very often. So, Ken, where else are you going to get the chance to discuss medicine and comedy together? I look forward to uh, hearing the episode of Co-Medicine featuring Dr. Ken Jeong. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, Ken. I don't know. I think that's going to do it. Honestly, I do think it's going to do it. Okay. Well, thank you. It's been a, such a pleasure to meet you. I'm so happy to have a guest uh, from across the pond on co-medicine. Uh, so thank you, everybody. And we'll put in our show notes ways people can find you on your, your Instagram. Sure. All the usual ones. 
and your YouTube and we're not doing X anymore. I'm not either. So we won't we won't put that one on. We'll put ways for people to find you in your website um, so that they can check out all of your videos because they're absolutely hilarious. And thank you so much for your time and for being on Co-Medicine. Oh, well, thank you for the, the invite. And I, yeah, I wasn't wasn't um, making it up when I said I really enjoyed chatting. And um, yeah, thank you. And that wraps up another episode of Co-Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Mark Edwards, uh, who wrote the music for this podcast. He is a very funny comedian, also a musician who writes music that makes me laugh. I don't know. Is that a thing? I don't know. He can do that. Also want to shout out to Heather McPherson of Twisted Spur Media, who's our producer and editor uh, who makes everything work. I could not do this podcast without her. And I want to thank you for listening and for sticking with us in season two. Uh, if if you're new to co-medicine welcome uh, if you've been listening since the beginning welcome back uh, it's great to have you here i hope you enjoyed it if you did please uh, share and like and give us a review if you didn't like it i don't know what you're still doing here if you didn't like this podcast you could do nothing nothing would be good <laughs>